This topic is meningitis and cephalitis. My name is Robert Kalaj and I'm the block leader for block five. So we break down meningitis as acute versus chronic meningitis and encephalitis. Oftentimes people presenting with any of those syndromes have an element of encephalitis, hence they have what's called meningoencephalitis. But in the pure form, meningitis is localized to the meninges with headache and stiff neck. Acute meningitis will present over the course of a few hours or less than a few days, while chronic meningitis typically presents over the course of many days and sometimes several weeks. Encephalitis in its pure form may present acutely or chronically in the absent, with the absence of meningeal signs or symptoms, um, but significant changes in behavior, personality, and alertness. The major symptoms of acute meningitis would be fever, headache, with light sensitivity, and there might, may, they might be seizure. Lethargy or progression to coma is not uncommon with severe meningitis due to bacteria, while these are typically absent with viral meningitis. The signs of, meningi- of acute meningitis include photophobia, neck stiffness, and this is combined to call what we call meningismus, there is Koenig's or Brzezinski's sign. Koenig's, beginning with a K, results in flexion of the knee, leading to neck pain and flexion. While Brzezinski's sign is flexion of the neck, leading to knee flexion that is involuntary. As I said, lethargy, stupor, and coma are common with bacterial meningitis associated often with other signs of sepsis, while a non-toxic presentation, i.e. the absence of mental status changes, minimal fever, or minimal um, toxicity is often seen with viral meningitis. A few patients may present with rash, in which case the clinician must consider meningococcus or rocky mounted spotted fever generally in a, within the context of a fulminant clinical presentation. Chronic meningitis similarly will have fever and headache, but meningismus may or may not be present. Changes in mental status are variable as well. They may have cranial nerve palsies, unlike with bacterial meningitis. However, in the case of encephalitis, they present typically with behavioral changes i.e. a personality change or lethargy or coma that progresses over the course of typically hours or days. Oftentimes there will be no signs of meningitis with a supple neck. So the pathogens of acute and chronic meningitis and encephalitis are legion. In the case of acute meningitis, we break it down according to age where newborns and infants have specific susceptibilities, especially to gram-negative pneumonia such as E. coli, group B strep, listeria, as well as strep pneumonia, H. flu, Neisseria meningitis, and don't forget tuberculosis. In, in older children and young adults, the spectrum shifts slightly to be represented mainly with strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, H. flu, and possibly Staph aureus. Viral pathogens are also included in the differential, predominantly enterovirus, also HSV2, and varicella zoster virus. In, in adults and elderly individuals, strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, H. influenza, are also present, but Listeria is again seen. Staph aureus is an important pathogen, as is group B strep, not listed here. Distinguishing bacterial from viral meningitis can be difficult, but as I stated in the previous slide, typically 
patients with viral meningitis are less ill appearing, do not have other signs of sepsis. The CSF is also very helpful with lymphocytic predominance in a viral meningitis, while neutrophilic predominance is characteristic of bacterial meningitis. Listeria is a special pathogen that warrants emphasis. As mentioned, this occurs in newborns and in older adults, but also, importantly, pregnancy, corticosteroids, general debility are risk factors for listeria, where exposure is often through, fo- is often through food, including soft cheeses or deli meats. HSV2 is a unique meningitis um, associated with primary genital herpes, while varicella zoster will cause meningitis in the context of shingles. Both can be self-limiting, although we treat usually with acyclovir, and generally people are not terribly ill upon presentation. Chronic meningitis, on the other hand, has a very diverse group of pathogens according to very different hosts. In the general population, one considers Borrelia, Burgdorferii, the agent of Lyme disease, syphilis, and tuberculosis, among some of the more common causes in persons without immunodeficiencies. And the cellular immune deficient host, tuberculosis is a predominant pathogen as are fungal infections due to cryptococcus, coccidiomycosis, or histoplasmosis. And syphilis also emerges because of the immune compromised host's inability to clear that pathogen from the CSF. Uniquely, in the case of injection drug users, mucormycosis is emerging as a major cause of chronic meningitis that must be recognized. Of note, interestingly, in the case of coccidiomycosis, Filipinos, African Americans, and Native Americans have a predisposition to disseminated coccidia, as well as the cellular deficient host. Encephalitis, in the absence of meningitis, is due most importantly to herpes simplex type 1 and the arboviruses that we will consider separately under the special consideration slide. In addition, though, newborns have congenital infection from herpes simplex virus 2, CMV, rubella, varicella, toxo, syphilis, and young children and newborn are particularly susceptible to cerebral malaria, which may present as a septic-like picture with encephalitis. Young children and, excuse me, children and young adults may have encephalitis due to a variety of pathogens, including mumps, measles, mycoplasma, which is a post-infectious sequelae of mycoplasma, usually pneumonia, and cat scratch disease, or Bartonella. Finally, older individuals are particularly susceptible to encephalitis due to West Nile virus, which will occur generally in the summer. So treatment of meningitis obviously depends on the pathogens that you are suspecting. In the case of acute meningitis, it's imperative to cover for strep pneumonia, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitis with ceftriaxone. You include ampicillin or penicillin for coverage of listeria, as no cephalosporins will cover this pathogen. Vancomycin is added for the possibility of penicillin-resistant strep pneumonia. And decadron is typically given before the first dose of antibiotics and for several days after antibiotic dosing um, to reduce inflammation. In the penicillin allergic host, carbapenem therapy with meropenem is recommended. An alternative for listeria, however, would be Bactrim in the penicillin allergic host. For chronic meningitis, since many of these pathogens involve fungus, amphotericin B is the initial treatment. 
and then specifically specific treatment is pathogen um, defined. For encephalitis, the only treatment generally is acyclovir, which is effective for herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster, and gancyclovir may be used to treat CMV. Prevention of pneumonia involves vaccination with the same vaccines used to prevent community-acquired pneumonia against H. flu and strep pneumonia, in addition, vaccine against Neisseria meningitidis. For individuals with close contact to a person with acute bacterial meningitis, that would be household contact or intimate contact, rifampin or ciprofloxacin is recommended. And healthcare workers are advised to wear masks during the first 48 hours of treatment with a person with acute meningitis because of the possibility of aerosolization of these pathogens. There is no specific preventive treatment for chronic meningitis. Since many encephalitises are transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks, DEET is used to prevent many of these pathogens that we will discuss separately in the next slide. So jumping directly to the arboviruses with encephalitis, there are many viruses that are transmitted through mosquito or tick exposure that are geographically distributed, including eastern and western equine encephalitis, St. Louis, La Crosse, California, Enterovirus 71, and Powassan encephalitis. I will not go into detail as to the geographic distribution, but be aware that these and many others will cause encephalitis usually in the late summer months with exposure to these insects. People traveling to the Far East are potentially at risk for Japanese encephalitis, usually in areas of China, usually rural areas of China. Such people should receive vaccination prior to travel. Jumping back to acute meningitis, there are important specific considerations that the clinician should keep in mind. First of all, subdural empyema, which is an abscess usually extending from the frontal or nasal sinuses, extending into the brain, may mimic bacterial meningitis. And it's critical to recognize this because surgery is mandatory. In addition, individuals that receive neurosurgical interventions, including craniotomies or even spinal surgery, are at risk for healthcare associated or neurosurgical associated meningitis, where the pathogens are very different, including Staph aureus with MSSA or MRSA. Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonas. And treatment is different targeting these pathogens with vancomycin, meropenem, or ceftazidine. Consider rocky mounted spotted fever, which may present as an acute meningoencephalitis with rash, for which the treatment is doxycycline. And consider leptospirosis, which may present with acute meningoencephalitis, jaundice, and hepatitis. Finally, headache is a predominant feature with malaria, dengue, and acute HIV. These are all syndromes that where meningitis is, is mimicked but is not involved. In the case of chronic meningitis, one also must consider non-infectious causes including sarcoidosis, drug-induced due to drugs such as non and Bactrim, and autoimmune processes including lupus, Basets or multiple sclerosis. So in summary, meningitis and encephalitis are caused by a diverse array of infectious and non-infectious pathogens. It is critical to recognize the life-threatening bacterial meningitises, distinguish this from subdural empyema, or recognize mimics of meningitis including malaria, dengue, acute HIV. Chronic meningitis can be easily missed because it may be indolent in consideration of host susceptibility, such as underlying immune deficiency, is critical. Encephalitis may be due to simplex type 1, which 
is a treatable and potentially reversible cause of encephalitis, while many other viruses which are not treated still should be recognized to avoid unnecessary further testing and establishing prognosis.